Welcome to Auto Chatter. Today's chatter is about the AMC Pacer. This car was quite unusual then for a few reasons, with the most obvious being that it resembled something George Jetson would drive, or fly. As always, facts, opinions, and speculation will be given. Please give a like or subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Now let's crank up the Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen and party on with the Pacer. In the early 70s, AMC's chief stylist Dick Teague started working on a new concept of passenger car. He correctly anticipated the future downsizing of vehicles as the 70s carried on. A vehicle that offered big car room but in a smaller and more aerodynamic package. I discussed a little about uh, Dick Teague in my AMC Gremlin episode as that was another project of his during these groovy times. This new vehicle was also being designed with enhanced safety in mind, making for a forward-thinking vehicle in more ways than one. AMC called it Project Amigo. They were even contemplating more unusual powertrain options, including a mid-engine setup or front-wheel drive that was far more rare than today, but ultimately went with a front-engine and rear-wheel drive configuration, which was the norm then. Speaking of engines, the original type of propulsion AMC was going for didn't even have any cylinders. In 1973, AMC signed a license agreement with the Curtis Wright Company to build rotary engines for their new car. This company at one point was the largest aviation firm in the U.S. and had a license to build Wankel rotary engines. The rotary engine is unusual as I mentioned before, lacking cylinders in favor of a spinning Doritos that were inside. They made good power for their small displacement and are simpler in design, having a lot less moving parts. They can also rev at high RPMs and offer smooth power. Rotary-powered cars in the 70s was a hopeful reality for several car makers. DeLorean, Alfa Romeo, Mercedes, Nissan, Toyota, Audi, Citroën, and General Motors, among others, all played around with making this work in a production vehicle. GM was even hopeful on the next Corvette being mid-engine and rotary powered. AMC caught wind of GM's rotary development and wanted in. AMC being a smaller player was no stranger to approaching Chrysler, Ford, GM, and others over the years for powertrain and other parts for their own vehicles. Unfortunately, GM couldn't get the rotary to work right, having issues with durability, fuel economy, and emissions so they dropped the rotary project in 1974. Mazda was pretty much the only car maker that got the rotary to work and produced them until 2012. So AMC now had this new car and no engine to put in it. Lacking not many alternatives, AMC modified the car a bit to fit their long straight six engines under the hood, which was a tight fit compared to the smaller rotary that was supposed to be there. Steering was rack and pinion, which for an American car was a rarity then. Car manufacturers know in advance what obstacles the government will throw at them later, and safety was no exception. New crash test standards were to start for 1980, including uh, rollovers, higher low speed bumper impact performance, and side impact protection. The Pacer was designed to meet or exceed these five years early as it would debut as a 75 model. The car was as wide as a domestic full size then, but isn't as long. Plus it had short overhangs front and rear. AMC had cab forward design decades before Chrysler was using it as a selling point in the 1990s. Also forward thinking was the jelly bean styling that became more the norm that decade too. The glass area was vast, offering excellent visibility if you had uh, optional AC in the summer, it would also struggle to keep things cool because of all that glass. Aerodynamics was good for the time, especially considering how blocky the average 1970s ride was then in comparison. The doors on Pacers were a bit of an oddity too. Pacers were all two-door only, and to allow easier access to the back seat, the passenger door was four inches longer. They did it for this side only, as that's a safer way to exit the vehicle curbside for countries like here where you drive on the right side of the road. That's also why vans, many and regular, largely just had passenger side sliding doors at one point. 
fuel mileage ratings were not the best on Pacers, as their last minute decision to shoehorn an inline six under the hood made for a car that got about five miles per gallon less than four cylinder rivals then. But maybe in hindsight it needed a bigger engine, as Pacers were not light. All the glass and safety made for a heavy vehicle. Base models had a curb weight around 3,000 pounds, and you could add hundreds more if you were starting to pile on options like an automatic transmission. A 1976 Mercedes-Benz W123 weighed about the same for reference. The AMC 3.8 liter inline six was standard, rated at 100 horsepower with a three-speed manual transmission on the column. At launch, a Pacer had an MSRP starting at $32.99 or about 18700 today. AMC's cheaper Gremlin was about 2700 bucks, or 15300 or so then. Pacer trim models at launch was the Base, Deluxe, and Sporty X package. The X got you bucket seats, larger 4.2 liter engine with more torque, tachometer and extra gauges, a floor mounted shifter, sporty steering wheel, stickers on the outside, fancier wheels and other bits. 1975 also had a Sundowner package for California only. This had the mandatory California emissions, bumper guards, fabric upholstery on the seats and door trim, rear window washer and wiper, and upgraded wheels. Plus you got a roof rack. Sundowner was only around for the first year. In 1975 you could get a 4.2 liter inline six optionally in your Pacer that was still rated at 100 horsepower but it had more torque. You could also pony up for a four-speed manual or automatic. 1975 was a good start for the Pacer sales-wise, with over 145,000 future Wayne's World fans buying them up. The car got generally positive reviews if one could get used to the styling, but was penalized for being underpowered. Between the high curb weight and the larger 4.2-liter six-cylinder having a small carburetor, it did not help with that. 1976, AMC adds a larger carb option for the 4.2, giving it 120 horsepower and a lot more torque. The high output option was welcome, but came at the cost of fuel economy, which was already not as good as some rivals before. Sales in 76 dipped some to about 117,000 units. For 1977, AMC added a new body style and trim package. A wagon version that looked a little more conventional was now an option. It was less than 100 pounds heavier and only 5 inches longer. AMC also offered the popular Levi's package on Pacers. I discussed this in my Gremlin chatter as it and other AMC models had it prior. They had seats and door trim that resembled Levi's jeans material. You also got a, a few small Levi decals on the outside of the car. The Sporty X package was on its last year for 1977, to be renamed a uh, sports package after that. Sales for 1977 fell again to just over 58,000, and the majority of those were the new wagon. For 1978, the Pacer got a refresh to the front end with a bulged out hood. This was not just for aesthetics, as 78 also offered a new engine option for the Pacer that would need it. A 5 liter V8 was now optional on Pacers with 130 horsepower. 0 to 60 was under 12 seconds, which was about 3 seconds less than a base model Pacer could achieve. Unfortunately, a lack of power didn't seem to be the only issue with Pacer as sales fell again. V8s were not as popular then with people as they were scared of fuel prices and only about 21,300 Pacers sold in 78. About 2,500 of those had the new 8-cylinder. 1979 offered a new limited package for Pacers. This is all-out luxury compared to what was offered before on your fishbowl. You got leather, seats, power windows, power door locks, more soundproofing, thicker carpeting, tilt steering, chrome accents, a hood ornament, and more. Now that's fancy. But Pacer buyers were ever shrinking as only about 10,215 were sold. The wagon version since launch in 1977 has been, has been the majority of sales and only about 10% of Pacers uh, moved out that year had a V8. 
1980 models were basically carryovers from 79. Less than 1,750 of them were sold in the U.S., with about 400 of them being the original coupes. The poor Pacer during development was striving to be ahead of the curve, but a lighter and more powerful rotary engine didn't pan out. This led to an engine not really suited for efficiency, and the heavy straight six threw off the handling. Adding an optional V8 just made it worse, and was not a popular option. The Pacer was designed for safety regulations coming five years into the future, but those pretty stringent safety regs that were due for 1980 were not nearly as strict by then as lobbyists from the Big Three managed to avoid it from coming to pass. Plus, at the time, safety was not a priority on many buyers' checks lists, unless they drove a Volvo, or maybe a Saab. The styling, which was very aerodynamic and futuristic for the time, was also polarizing to many and it didn't really age well. The end result was a heavy, slow, and weird looking vehicle with so-so gas mileage. Even when it was used in the movie Wayne's World in the 1990s, the car was intended to be a joke that a bunch of losers drove around in. Disney uh, then likely had similar views as the Wayne's World writers. 90s kids probably noticed Goofy's car from a Goofy movie was a pacer wagon. Today, pacers have a cult following and rare survivors uh, can command a premium. We're not talking Mark IV Super levels, mind you, but they are worth a lot more than when they were used when I was in high school. Anyway, leave a comment if you had one or stories to tell about them if you would. And on that note, this has been my Pacer Chatter, and I do hope you liked it. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. Until next time, chatter out.